Hey guys, uh, welcome to this series of videos on an introduction to quantum field theory. Um, I think the goal of these videos comes from an acknowledgement that in a lot of introductory quantum field theory courses and textbooks, um, quantum field theory seems to be introduced in a very haphazard way. Uh, there doesn't really seem to be a particularly compelling narrative or story that takes you from the lessons about physics that we learnt from quantum mechanics uh, and combining them with what we know about physics from special relativity, bringing them together into you know, a, a, a framework that naturally leads you to quantum field theory. So the goal of these videos is to be relatively short and hopefully relatively uh, digestible, but at the same time, not really to skip out on any of the mathematical details. Um, so I just thought I'd start the video by summarizing the like general uh, theme of, uh, of the course. So basically we're gonna start with uh, quantum mechanics and special relativity. Um, and the idea is that to combine these two together, we're gonna to argue that uh, the way to combine them is to look at them through the lens of an area of mathematics called group theory. Um, that will cause us to, in to discover something called Wigner's classification, which is where you, you use the representations of the Poincare group to uh, determine what kinds of particles exist in nature. Um, we'll also be motivated a lot by considering scattering processes and the history of the development of QFT is, is, is linked with the um, study of scattering processes kind of inextricably. So we wish to have the S matrix, which is a, a, an object that we introduced to calculate the probability of various scattering events from happening. We want, we want that to be Lorentz invariant to fit with special relativity. So these two are gonna give us some massive constraints on the theory. Um, they're gonna tell us a lot about the Hilbert spaces, that's gonna come from Wigner's classification, and the Lorentz invariant S matrix element will give us lots of constraints on what uh, various interaction Hamiltonians, things like that, what kind of form they can take. At this point, we then introduce a third principle called the cluster decomposition principle. The idea of cluster decomposition is that if I do scattering experiments at two laboratories that are well separated, and by well separated, I mean they could be on opposite sides of the universe, opposite sides of the earth, different cities, uh, whatever it is, the results of these two experiments in separate labs, they shouldn't affect each other. Um, and th that will cause us to introduce these peculiar operators called creation and annihilation operators. It is then the combination of these two things here, the constraints on the Lorentz invariance of the S matrix and having to create the theory out of creation and annihilation operators, the combination of these two things, that will naturally lead us to quantum, quantum field theory. The ultimate goal of this first video is to review elements of quantum mechanics that will need to understand um, the development of quantum field theory. And the culmination of this episode will be in understanding and explaining the symmetry representation theorem, <clears throat> which is a very important theorem in quantum mechanics and states that when you have some symmetry of your quantum system, there would be some operator that you can use to represent that symmetry. So I thought we'd start by just overviewing what exactly a Hilbert space is. Uh, so in quantum mechanics, a, um, the state space is usually described by a Hilbert space. Now a Hilbert space is a set and it has three functions. This function notation, if you're not familiar with it, it starts with the name of the function and then you have a colon. And then just to the right of the colon is what's called the domain of the function. <clears throat> it's gonna be some set and uh, the things that are fed into the function are elements from that set. And then to set to the right of the arrow, we'll call that the codomain. <clears throat> That's gonna be the target space of the map. So you can think about the plus, the scalar multiplication and the inner product. Um, as functions. And when you just have the set and the plus and the scalar multiplication, they form a complex Hilbert space and all of the axioms and um, mathematical structure that is involved in that. The other thing we have is we have this sesquilinear inner product. Sesquilinear inner product has three axioms, um, this first one here and the second one, uh, which is the linearity. When you combine these two together, you understand the meaning of the word sesquilinear. So as you can see from axiom two, the inner product is linear in the second entry, which is the vector that's on the right hand side. But when you combine this with the first one, then it means that the inner product is actually anti-linear in the first entry. And that's what sesquilinear means. 
If you don't understand what antilinear means, then just hold your breath because we're going to cover antilinear operators very briefly in a few slides time. And then this third important axiom that if I take the inner product of a vector with itself, I will always get a real number that is uh, greater than or equal to zero. You can show that this will always be a real number just from the first axiom. Um, and you will only get zero if you have the zero vector, which is guaranteed to exist by one of the axioms of the vector space. So now that we know what a Hilbert space is, how do we actually describe the states of physical systems using this apparatus? It's usually stated in a quantum mechanics class that a pure state, one with no classical uncertainty, is represented by a vector that's inside the Hilbert space. However, you may also know that any two vectors that differ by the multiplication of a constant they both describe the same physical state. So we can use this to define an equivalence relation. For those of you that don't know what an equivalence relation is, we'll quickly go through this. Given some set, capital X, a relation is just a way of comparing two elements of the set. So the statement X tilde Y is a proposition that should be read X is equivalent to Y. It can either be true or false. Now, if this relation satisfies the three properties the first one being reflexivity, that any element is equivalent to itself. The second one being symmetry, that if x is equivalent to y, then y is equivalent to x. And the third one being transitivity, that if x and y are equivalent, and y and z are equivalent, then that means that x and z are equivalent. Then this relation may be deemed an equivalence relation. Given an equivalence relation, we can define equivalence classes. So, and we represent these with square brackets. So you can see here that the lowercase x is an element of the set. The equivalence class, x in square brackets, is the set of all elements in the larger set that are equivalent to x. The transitivity property means that these equivalence classes partition the set. And we can define another set, which is just the collection of all the equivalence classes, which we write x tilde. This is called the identification space. To understand how an equivalence class partitions the set, have a look at the drawing just on the left. We have some larger set, capital X, and the equivalence relation has split this set into three equivalence classes. Now, if you look at the element lowercase x and the element x prime, they're in the same equivalence class. So that means that these two elements are equivalent and their two equivalence classes are equal. Now, if you consider the element y, y is in a different equivalence class to x, so it, it doesn't tilde x. Now that doesn't just mean that the equivalence class of x is not equal to the equivalence class of y, it actually means that the intersection of the equivalence classes is the empty set. This property is guaranteed by the third property, transitivity of the equivalence relation. So how do we use this in conjunction with our Hilbert space? Well, we can define an equivalence relation on the Hilbert space by saying that any two vectors are equivalent to each other if they're related by multiplication by a complex number. The equivalence classes are then called rays, which is a terminology that you may or may not be familiar with. So we can, um, we can take the identification space, H tilde, we can identify this as the space of physical states describing our quantum system. The next step in our review of the important aspects of quantum mechanics that we need to understand quantum field theory is that of operators. As you probably know from your undergraduate days, operators play a very important role in quantum mechanics. They play the role of observables, they play the role of transformations, and they also can help us make contact with the classical limit of a quantum mechanical system. Um, often quantization is presented in terms of just taking classical observables in classical physics and just promoting them to operators. So we'll represent operators by putting hats on them. This is where usually a lecture tells what I think is the biggest lie in a quantum field theory course, that they won't need to bother putting hats on the operators and it will be clear from context whether something is an operator and something is not. Um, in my experience, that is not true. Now, there are two main types of operators that we need to consider in this course. Firstly, as linear operators, which hopefully you are all familiar with. And the main property of linear operators is summarized there and the definition of the adjoint. I know pure mathematicians may be screaming that I give this as the definition of the adjoint, but as far as we're concerned as physicists, that's the definition of, the, of an adjoint. 
The two types of linear operators that will most concern us is that of firstly Hermitian or self-adjoint operators where the operator equals its adjoint or Hermitian conjugate. Um, the important property of Hermitian operators is that the eigenvalues are real, which is why we use them to represent observables, and also that the eigenvectors can be chosen to provide an orthonormal basis of the entire Hilbert space. The other important case will be unitary operators, as we will see later on um, in this lecture. Now, antilinear operators act almost the same as linear operators, except when acting on a linear combination of vectors, any scalars they become complex conjugated after being acted on by the operator. And also the definition of the adjoint is slightly different from that of linear operators. To see why we have to define it this way, just consider a linear combination of vectors, either on the left or on the right. If we defined it in the way that the adjoint is defined for linear operators, then you would have a situation where something would be, uh, on, on one side of the equation, it would be linear, in a vector, and in the other side of the equation, it would be antilinear. And we'll find that anti-unitary operators, which have the same defining property, that the adjoint equals the inverse, will also be important in quantum mechanics. Finally, as our last basic element of quantum mechanics that we need to review, we'll just very quickly talk about measurement. Now, we're not really going to go into any of the philosophy here. We're not going to talk about many worlds or anything like that. We're just going to basically go through the basic ideas of the Copenhagen interpretation. Um, so in quantum mechanics, observables are going to be described by Hermitian operators, and they are, all have real eigenvalues. And as we said before, the eigenvectors form an orthonormal basis of the Hilbert space. So we can take all of the rays that correspond to the equivalence classes of each of the eigenvectors, and if a system is in a state described by the ray R, and we design an experiment in which we decide to measure the observable H, then the probability that we're gonna measure a given value, En, is gonna be given by the dot product of a vector in the ray R with the eigenvector N. Now we're gonna choose a convention in which any vectors that we take from any ray, we're just going to because we, we kind of have a choice of which vector we pick, we're just going to pick one that's normalized to unity. In that case, then, this probability doesn't actually depend on which vector we take from the ray R. After we measure the observable En, the system is stated to collapse into the state Rn. Um, again, we're not going to go into any of the philosophy of how you actually formulate when a collapse happens or what it is. Uh, we're just going to assume for this course you can do measurements. Once you do a measurement, the system will collapse. So now that we've actually pretty much summarized everything about basic quantum mechanics that we're going to need for this course, we can start talking about symmetries, which is really the main culmination of the course. Um, now, as we stated before, the space of physical states is not actually the vectors in the Hilbert space, but it's these sets of equivalence classes or rays or identification space, however you want to think about it. Um, now a symmetry transformation we're going to assume is a bijection in this space of physical states, not in the space of vectors. Now for those who don't know, a bijection is a function that is both one-to-one -one and onto. Um, now what those two properties mean is summarized into a uh, diagrams on the right here. The thing that's nice about a bijection um, is that you can always find an inverse just by reversing the arrows on that diagram. Now, a symmetry transformation is a transformation that in some senses doesn't actually change the physics. So we've transformed all of the physical states. And when we say none of the physics has changed, we mean that the probabilities are preserved under this transformation. So we'll start with the basic example. Suppose we have a spin half system. We know that this is a two dimensional uh, vector space. So we could define a basis as a vector that is the particle having a spin up in the z direction and the particle having spin down in the z direction. Now consider this vector here, which is a linear combination of the two, that's gonna be the member of some ray and the eigenvectors are going to be 
also the member of two rays, which we're going to call r plus and r minus. <clears throat> now, if I were to measure the probability, well, if I were to measure the spin of the system in the z direction, three quarters of the time I would measure it to have spin up and a quarter of the time I would measure it to have spin down. Now consider a symmetry transformation that in this case will be a, a rotation that will turn the z-axis into the x-axis. Now if we assume after this rotation, this new vector, which is a linear combination of the particle having spin up in the x-direction and the particle having spin down in the x-direction, this is going to be inside the transformed ray, r prime, and these other two vectors, the spin up in the x-direction and the spin down in the z-direction, they're part of the transformed rays from r plus and r minus. If this is the case, then this would be considered a symmetry transformation because the probabilities are preserved. So you would still have a three quarter probability of measuring the particle to have spin up and a one quarter probability of measuring the particle to have spin down. It's just that you're now measuring it in the x direction. So now we come to the symmetry representation theorem. I would say that this is possibly one of the most important theorems in all of quantum physics. And it was first proved by Eugene Wigner in the 1930s, although he initially only proved it for linear operators. And it was noted later that you can extend the proof to antilinear operators, as we'll see. But essentially, the theorem says that if I have any symmetry transformation, then I may represent this by an operator acting on the Hilbert space itself, rather than just transforming the, the rays in the state of in the space of physical states, and that that operator is either going to be linear and unitary or anti-linear and anti-unitary. <clears throat> now, almost all transformations will be represented by linear and unitary operators. Um, in fact, the only anti-linear, anti-unitary symmetry transformation that we'll consider is time reversal. So just to understand exactly what this theory means, we're starting with some bijection in the space of physical states. And that bijection preserves probabilities. Now, the idea is that given a, a symmetry transformation like this, we can define some operator acting on the Hilbert space itself, such that if a vector is in the ray R before the symmetry transformation, the operator acting on that vector will then be in the ray R prime, which is going to be the transformed ray under the symmetry transformation and that that vector is either linear and unitary or antilinear and anti-unitary, as we said. Um, this first property, the fact that the transformed vector is in the transformed ray, that is what we mean when we say it represents the symmetry. And the fact that it is, its adjoint is its inverse is what we mean when we say it's either unitary or anti-unitary. So that's pretty much it for this video. Um, in the next video, we'll look at group theory um, in some depth and explain how that's related to the symmetry representation theorem that we've just learned. This is really the start of the journey towards understanding quantum field theory, because we will see that when we look at special relativity, all Einstein's postulates of special relativity will really cause us to do in terms of quantum mechanics is to identify some symmetry group. And the symmetry group will be a whole host of symmetry transformations. But this theorem here that we just proved that will allow us to assume that we have some operators that represent those symmetry transformations acting on the Hilbert space. And it's classifying the way that those symmetry transformations are represented that will allow us to understand the form that our Hilbert spaces take in quantum field theory and ultimately allow us to combine the lessons about how to do physics from quantum mechanics with the lessons about how to do physics from special relativity.